Right, I think we've got everyone here this morning. Larry, Chris, Josh, Nick, welcome. Good to, good to see y'all. Um, this is Jeff Garlitz with Craftco moderating today. I help serve on the board with Laura for Cyber Wyoming and would like to give a shout out to Laura for putting this all together. Um, she, she does an awesome job here. So thank you, Laura and Cyber Wyoming. Um, if we could, Josh, um, maybe give just a, a very short introduction for yourself and I'll, I'll go through the room there and we'll get started. Sure, thanks and good morning, everybody. My name is Josh Hannes. I'm with the Wyoming Hospital Association. We represent all the hospitals in Wyoming and through Leading Age Wyoming, about 30 nursing homes. And I've been here in this position for about three years. And prior to that, I worked at Shine Regional Medical Center. Very good, thank you, Josh. Good to have you here. Nick, uh, short introduction for yourself. Yeah, sure. So my name is Nick Reynolds. And up until about uh, two weeks ago, I was the state politics and policy reporter for Wildfile. And prior to that, I was the state house reporter for the Casper Star Tribune uh, almost three years. Very good. Chris, good to see you this morning. A uh, little introduction for yourself, please. Good morning. I'm Chris Rothbus. I'm the Senate Minority Leader in the Wyoming Legislature. Thanks, Chris. And Larry. Uh, yes, uh, Larry Kerbin. I'm a uh, family physician from uh, Buffalo. Um, I retired, uh, but I did practice in Buffalo for about 30 years. And then after that, I uh, worked for the University of Washington uh, with the Wyoming Whammy program, worked with medical students, and just retired from that position a few months ago. Very good. Thank you all. Welcome, everybody here. And um, I guess we'll, we'll get right into it. So we've got some of the statements that we've heard in Wyoming about health care and just want to get you all to weigh in on whether these are true and false and why. So um, the first one we have here is health care technology will lead to better health care for Wyoming citizens. Uh, I'll, I'll take that one just to start and then others can chime in. I, I think technology uh, has its advantages, but we have to remember that technology is expensive and te more technology does not always mean better health, particularly when you have a lack of access to that health care. As technology drives costs up, uh, that leaves more people uh, um, lacking access if they can't afford that technology. Technology is a great thing and, and our recent uh, you know, uh, production of vaccines is a good example, but we also have to remember that technology is expensive and that we have a healthcare system that's based on um, um, intervention rather than prevention. And, and as we all know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound to cure. And our healthcare system with its high technology is, is very much uh, oriented towards uh, uh, intervention and that pound of cure versus prevention. And so I think, yes, technology will, is, uh, will lead to better health for Wyoming citizens, but it also, we have to be careful that it doesn't increase the cost and diminish the access to healthcare. And so I, I would be uh, interested to hear what others have to say about that. Sure. <laughs> so I think Dr. Kerbin's right. I'd agree with all that. I mean, the the answer to the, the question or to the statement is, like, is it depends. There's certainly a lot of ways that technology can, um, uh, Remote patient monitoring is a good example, right? So people with a chronic disease who can use technology so their physician can monitor, say, their their blood pressure, their heart rate, um, A1Cs, things like that. I mean, that's a that's a good way to help manage a, a chronic condition and um, and to have a, a a different kind of relationship with your provider. So there's certainly a lot of benefits, but. Um, I agree with Dr. Kerbin there. There's a cost to that, right? And we just can't throw technology at every problem and say that's that's the solution. But I think there are a lot of really excellent and thoughtful ways that we're starting to use technology well in the future to, to help provide access and um, and help people manage manage conditions. And hopefully, you know, with with an eye towards prevention, like Dr. Kerbin said, and and how, how do we how do we implement technology and develop technologies that that start a little more upstream? I'll just jump in next. I, I think the correct statement is technology should improve healthcare outcomes for the people of Wyoming. Uh, will it? I, I think that what we heard from Josh and Larry is exactly right, that uh, there are a lot of challenges that we have in Wyoming uh, and in the 
the United States that preclude access and, and make it challenging to access these advanced technologies because of the price, because of the uh, other restrictions that, that are on them. So while availability of technology has the potential to do amazing things, and it really will bring down costs, uh, telehealth, for example, I think is something that, that will directly reduce the cost of healthcare in Wyoming, and we can expect uh, that in many instances. The, the reality is that we have enough policy challenges and hurdles in the way of adoption and availability widespread of advanced and emerging technologies that uh, we, we probably won't see that in the near future unless we have some rather fundamental changes in the, the ability to access and and uh, have affordability associated with those those healthcare outcomes. So uh, I'm hopeful and, and I know that there are a lot of incredible technologies on the horizon, but the challenges are in the way. Very good. Thank you all. Nick, uh, anything to add on that one? On uh, that one, i uh, got to be honest, I'm going to stay in my lane on this one. These guys are much more smarter on that side. Than <laughs> all right, this. no worries. Um, this is an interesting one to me. If we move on to the next one, um, people will get their health care anyway, even if they don't have insurance. Uh, weigh in on that. Is that a true or false statement and, and why? Uh, I'll take that one to lead off, I guess. Uh, I would say that, yes, people will get their health care anyway, even if they don't have insurance. But I think the way they get that health care, you know, is what creates issues. And, and yes, people will access, you can go to the emergency room and, and you'll get treated because of the EMTALA rules. But what's happening if you lack access to primary care is you, you may uh, put off being seen for a condition until uh, uh, it's very late in the game and then, um, your condition is uh, advanced and therefore the treatment is much more expensive. And of course, somebody is going to pay for that care. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount of cost shifting. Um, hospitals uh, 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 bill those who can pay to, to cover that cost of that care. So yes, people will get care if they don't have insurance, but that is probably the least efficient way to do that and probably does not lead to uh, better outcomes for people because if you don't have access to care and and you wait till the last minute to get care uh, you, you're shifting away from that ounce of prevention down to the pound to cure which is much more expensive is what I would say about that so yes you can get care but it's not the best way to access care yeah <clears throat> again I agree completely with with the doctor um, Again, you know, hospitals and, and emergency rooms are, are excellent at if you show up with an emergent condition and they, you know, the doctors and nurses and staff there will, you know, be able to help you, but then you have to go back home. And if you don't have access via health insurance to get, you know, aftercare from an operation to get preventative care and the front door to the healthcare system for you becomes the emergency room, like Dr. Kerbin said, it's, it's wildly expensive and it's, it's an inappropriate setting for care. And, and health insurance allows people the opportunity to get the right care in the right setting at the right time. Um, certainly prevention is a part of that, but we don't want people in our communities um, who are becoming more and more severely ill until they have to absolutely show up at the emergency room. Um, that that's not the type of communities that I think we all want to live in. We want people to be healthy and productive and happy and, and out in the world, you know, doing the things that we all want to do. And if you're not able to manage a condition or you become acutely ill somehow, then you have to show up at the emergency room. That that's, that, that's not the way we get to where I think we want to be as in, in our communities. So, um, sure. If you're, if you're really sick, you're severely injured, you can show up at a hospital, but, I don't think that's the way we want anybody accessing healthcare. Nick, I'm going to defer to you. Go ahead, man. Yeah, well, I can't really comment too much on the you know, ver veracity of what everyone else has said because you know they're the real professionals. I'm mostly just here to comment on how, how the conversation has kind of played out the legislative lever just as a um, third party observer. But it was always interesting to hear when this came up. Um, you know, we're always talking about the hospital's fiscal health in and, and conversations about, um, particularly among legislators. Um, you know, they would often point to the um, 
I, I guess maybe some anecdotal data that they've seen out of other states, maybe cherry picking where that was from when in reality we saw groups like the Wyoming Hospital Association coming to these committee meetings and saying that the levels of uncompensated care they provided to these people who didn't have insurance was one of the biggest drags on their budget. And it, it was always interesting to me, you know, having that um, direct testimony from people who are actually dealing with this and um, ultimately balancing these uh, budgets at the end of the day. And I, I guess how often that testimony was thrown aside in favor of maybe what some other party was saying, or um, you know, maybe a group that was um, telling lawmakers of a certain uh, I, I guess a certain disposition what they wanted to hear. And uh, I know we're going to get into that a little bit more later, but um, that was always in it was always interesting to see how this conversation kind of uh, reared its head in some of the committee meetings that I'd observed uh, where Medicaid expansion was being discussed. And I'll just add quickly that the emergency room doesn't provide chemotherapy. The emergency room doesn't provide uh, early treatment for diabetes uh, and, and prevention as opposed to um, treatment of the, of the implications and, and of the, uh, emergent circumstances of that perhaps diabetic episode. Um, so while technically you'll receive health care regardless of your income, uh, the quality and flavor of that health care is going to vary dramatically depending on that income. And uh, as, as we were talking about this, I, I pulled up a chart, which I had read a number of years ago, again, with the Medicaid expansion debate. And I think we've got a platform here that I just want to take advantage of and, and paste in a chart if it's possible. If it's not and we fail quickly, uh, we won't do it. But let's see, how do we do that? Go to, is it notes? No, well, we'll see. I paste that there. I'm going to try for very long. All right, I'll surrender. We'll figure this out later. Uh, the take-home message, though, is this is from a, a study back in, I think, 2015, associating income and life expectancy in the United States. For uh, this, this data is for men. Uh, if you're 40 years old uh, in 2014, uh, as a man, you could expect to live to be 77 years old if you were in the bottom income quartile of the country. If you were in the top income quartile, you could expect to live to be 87 years old. A 10-year difference in life expectancy by quartile of income. Uh, that's a very big difference, and it's based very much on this conversation we've just been having about what type of health care you get. So you might get health care, but you can expect 10 years lower life expectancy as a result of that health care. So I think that's a, a great place to jump into this uh, next question that we have for you guys. And um, just talking about those costs of health care and what you get on the high end versus the low end. Um, this question is Wyoming health care costs are higher than the rest of the country. Is that playing into uh, these things? I guess I can start with that. Uh, there is no question that Wyoming has some of the highest healthcare costs in the country. And I don't know that, I, I think it's multifactorial. Um, there's uh, blame to go around, I think, all elements. Um, and I think there was a really good article uh, in 2019 in the Casper paper that really talked with, with all the players and, and maybe Josh can chip in on this, but we do have very high healthcare costs. And there's there's a variety of reasons for that um, in Wyoming, because it's a small state, lots of distance involved. There's a lack of competition, but also it costs more if you're a small hospital to you know, provide what you think is the level of care your community desires. And then there's also the idea that, unfortunately, the way our entire healthcare system, and this, this links back somewhat to the US healthcare system, that for the amount of money we pay, we don't get uh, the best health care. And recently, the Commonwealth Fund came out with uh, their annual ranking of the 11 developed countries on how they rank on health care. And it, as usual, the United States placed dead last. So there's countries that spend somewhere in the neighborhood of six to seven percent of their GDP on health care that rank way uh, higher than, than the United States does. And we spend approximately 17 percent of our GDP on health care. And so 
I think the high cost of healthcare in Wyoming is sort of a reflection of that, exacerbated by our small size, great distance, and, and um, a, a variety of factors that everybody is willing to point fingers at. And I think uh, uh, Chris and Josh and, and Nick probably have a better handle on those different uh, entities than I do, but I would say that uh, yes, Wyoming does have uh, very high health care costs, and, and that is an issue for the state. And, and maybe Chris uh, or, or Josh, you could chime in on that. Yeah, I'll jump in and just say that, uh, you know, I, I think everyone that has a finger pointing at them is at least partially to blame. And, and we certainly do have the highest, among the highest health care costs in the country in a country that already has ridiculously high healthcare costs. Uh, but I, I don't think anyone deserves more blame and scrutiny than the Wyoming legislature, uh, where in the, in the 10 plus years that I've been in the legislature, uh, we've taken to my count precisely no meaningful action in reducing healthcare costs. Uh, we've advanced no thoughtful, sound policies. We've, we've done nothing to really provide the resources and support that would help to bring down the costs in a rural setting. Uh, and honestly, it's it's just been a tremendous disappointment for me to see proposal after proposal that could have a meaningful effect on that, such as Medicaid expansion, but not limited to Medicaid expansion, uh, come to a, a tragic end. Because at the end of the day, I, I think the legislature doesn't want to address for political reasons, uh, a problem that is consequentially focused on uh, national level politics and, and associated with the Affordable Care Act and sort of some legacy considerations that, that have just gotten us to a point where it's politically intractable to move forward with solutions that seem to be partisan, even though they're just pragmatic. And even jumping off of what Chris said, just watching this, um, I mean, I remember being sure on the 2020 Republican primaries, you know, that was, uh, I, I guess, like a period of pretty huge political tension for the entire state. But when um, you did have um, some races that actually got into talking about health care policy, um, there were some candidates that were maybe approaching the issue from a you know, completely unrealistic position, you know, saying that just saying vaguely that they would open up competition between healthcare insurers and lowering prices that way. Well, there's a reason that we don't have competition here anyway. It's because it's just a really expensive place to uh, set up shop or selling insurance uh, over state lines again similar reasons have kind of held us from doing that. And there have been numerous uh, suggestions over the years of uh, ways to address this problem that just haven't gotten there. And um, the only solutions that are presented uh, are either completely far-fetched and just kind of based off of talking points as opposed to actual policy, or they find ways to avoid um, going toward something like Medicaid expansion, which um, every industry group is advocating for. Um, all the research is shown to bear out, but um, they, continually talk themselves out of it, um, oftentimes for politics and oftentimes justifying their votes by uh, citing sometimes inaccurate information. And uh, that's just kind of what I've seen on the ground, just uh, watching some of these conversations play out in the Capitol. So I think it's certainly worth taking an opportunity to say, yes, Medicaid expansion would be helpful, right? But as everybody said, there's a lot of um, a lot of factors that contribute to high cost. Um, again, Medicaid expansion is one of the big ones, right? It would bring a lot of money into the state and cover a lot of people, but, um, and we certainly advocate for that, but there are, it is a complicated issue. And I think it's, it's necessary to honor those. And I think kind of like Nick is saying, there's some talking points that, that people bring up, but it's, it's more complicated than that. And it's, and it's, difficult to understand and it requires study and, um, and, and, you know, thoughtful leadership from, from people on this issue. Um, you know, Wyoming hospitals, as was mentioned before, you know, it's between 100 and 120 million dollars of uncompensated care across this state um, with a lot of very small rural hospitals that have slim or, or negative margins in some years, right? This is, um, it's not a, it's not a tenable situation uh, to be in, you know, we pay more hospitals pay more typically than market rates for some specialty providers to come in. 
and there's just not a lot of volume to spread that cost um, to, to spread out that cost. And so there is, um, you know, shifting to other payers to, to cover that total cost to have the type of services and communities that that communities want and deserve. But we have a number of other issues in the state. We have pretty high uninsured rates. I mean, it varies between 12 and 15 percent. Um, so those are, are patients that are either one not seeking care, which is no good. Um, they're they're self-pay or those are that's care that's being um, deeply discounted or provided for free. I mean, all of our hospitals offer sliding fee scales based on income. And um, I, I know many clinics and, and physicians in the state do the same thing um, because we know we have a responsibility to care uh, for our neighbors. But one other thing when we talk about cost, and I think this is an important question because it matters, certainly costs are high, universal cost of healthcare in the country and in the state is high. But when I say cost or Senator Rothfuss says cost, whose cost are we talking about? Um, you know, are we talking about in the, medic, the state Medicaid program? Certainly that's a, a area legislators are focused on. If I'm an employer who provides health benefits to my employees, is it my cost that I'm talking about? And those are all addressed in different ways, right? So, um, you know, I think Montana recently changed their reimbursement model to providers um, for their state employees health plan um, and talked about the savings. Well, I don't know that that's really savings. They just reimbursed less, right? Um, and, and I think it's just one of the nuances and complications to this discussion. And, and it's going to look differently depending on who you ask and whose cost you're talking about. Very good. Thank you. Um, got some more on cost and, and Medicare here in the future and interested to hear, but uh, th this is an interesting one here too. And I've, I've heard it often. Um, I'll get better health care if I leave the state. I guess maybe for the sake of efficiency, I'll, I'll always go first, but um, you, you know, uh, you hear that a lot and, and that's always a perception. I mean, it, it, you can even say uh, I can get better health care in the next county. And I think that is a myth for the most part. There's certainly some very highly specialized types of care that are not available in Wyoming. And one, you know, has to leave the state for that. I'm thinking of, of uh, you know, certain really, uh, you know, maybe neurosurgical conditions or maybe um, uh, premature infants that need uh, specialized uh, NICU care. But by and large, when it comes to the kinds of health care that Wyomingites need, it's available in this state. What's unique about Wyoming is that we have a major, you know, medical center city on every border. Um, and, and that uh, does provide the opportunity to leave the state to get health care. But if, you know, with, uh, uh, we're, we're harmed by distance in a sense, and it's hard to get to say Casper where we have uh, excellent health care or Cheyenne, uh, you know, if, if you live in uh, Evanston, it certainly might be easier to go to Salt Lake City, but that doesn't necessarily mean the care is better. And the other thing to keep in mind is when you get care in a distant location, if you have a complication or a problem, you know, you're going to be back in your community in Wyoming. And so I think that it's uh, very important to establish um, your care through uh, your local community physicians, just because if you do have to go out of state to get care uh, and you have a complication, it's going to be your local physician that's going to have to deal with that complication. So I think it's very important to keep in mind that healthcare should be local um, and, and, and let your physician choose. Uh, he trusts uh, the kind of care that you would get, say, if he refers you to, say, to Casper or Cheyenne. I would trust that. Uh, if you need to go to an outside facility because you have a very unique or an unusual condition, I think your local physician is somebody who, who understands that and, and, and could be trusted to uh, uh, make that referral. But I think just to leave the state because you think you're going to get um, – uh, better health care. That doesn't always work out in my experience. I've seen people develop complications when they went out of state and then and then couldn't get back to the person who provided their care. And so it was up to us as local physicians to sort of help them uh, deal with some of the issues that came up. So I would keep in mind that the local is always better, even though there are some specialized care that one might have to seek outside the state. 
I'd, I'd just add on to that. I, I think everything Larry said is exactly right. Uh, there, there's just realities of scaling and uh, availability of equipment and uh, machines and testing that not every medical facility in Wyoming is going to have. So you're going to look to a place for availability of, of certain resources, uh, and that's going to end up becoming a factor. There might be circumstances when you do need to go to a larger population center. That might be Casper. But it might be, you know, your nearest neighbor, as Larry was pointing out. I don't think there's any problem with that. And I don't think that uh, Wyoming hospitals should be aspiring to purchase every piece of equipment under the sun uh, because that's not cost effective. That actually does drive up costs when you have when you over purchase and overbuild, so to speak, uh, your medical community. And, and we should recognize that there are, are circumstances in which somebody's going to need to go to a larger population center, uh, center, a larger hospital uh, to get some work done. But the focus should always be back through your community, your community doctor and, and the resources you have available, I think, for the best health outcomes. Um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the idea that every one of the hospitals in the state of Wyoming doesn't have every resource that everyone might need under all circumstances. It would honestly be a bit ridiculous. And even the large hospitals in our region would send you to other regional hospitals for certain conditions and circumstances, depending on where the the best specialists might be. And, and that's a more responsible approach to medicine. Yeah, I, I, I again, think all of that's correct. And I, I think what I would add, though, is um, for those conditions that or situations that can't be dealt with um, in state, a number of our facilities have um, agreements with hospitals in other states so that you can come back quickly and be in your home community and receive that aftercare. So premature babies is a good example. A number of our hospitals work with the children's hospitals in Colorado, Montana, uh, Utah, Idaho, or, um, Idaho. And, um, you know, so we don't have that specialty here. We can't deliver babies, you know, most of our hospitals at a, at a certain um, at a certain gestation and they have to go somewhere else, but then we want them back here quickly and, and, and leverage the resources and partnerships of other places so that um, you don't have to be down in Denver for months with a, with an ill child or with a premature baby. And so, um, you know, there, there's certainly the quality in Wyoming. I mean, of course, I believe the quality in Wyoming is incredibly high, um, but there are those situations where you have to go out of state, but our providers and hospitals are, are working with partners in other states so that we can make that a, a more seamless transition back and forth. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate those. So um, here's one that I, I'd be interested to hear the answer to. I know, know pretty much nothing about the liability insurance and tort laws are leading to higher costs of health care of Wyoming. So we talked about uh, costs there just a little bit ago. Is uh, liability and insurance and tort laws a, a major contributing factor? That gets into the political talking point concept that doesn't necessarily bear out when you do the research. Um, it was a very contentious issue a number of years ago. I think my first few years in the legislature was when it was uh, roaming the countryside and some states were doing tort reform on liability insurance to bring down the costs associated with that. Uh, other states were resisting. And uh, at the end of the day, the states that did pass substantial tort reform uh, didn't see any tremendous associated savings. I, I think they did see a small savings, if I'm not mistaken, uh, because it, it did technically bring down, based on my understanding, the cost of, of some of the insurance, but uh, it didn't do so meaningfully. And as a result, it's sort of fizzled out, but it's still a talking point among um, some that that would like to see limitations on on tort and and liability ceilings. Um, the, the question kind of comes down to uh, what you want to see and how much limitation you want to put on uh, individuals' access to courts, and anytime you are restricting access to courts or capping liabilities, uh, you are taking rights away from individual citizens and, and typically handing it to businesses or corporations or other entities. So there's a balance there uh, that 
is is commonly debated, and we've we've had that debate in the Wyoming legislature. Um, I don't see that as a cost driver in Wyoming. Uh, I have heard others suggest it's a cost driver, but I, I keep asking for data and support and evidence and analysis that would suggest that changing tort law in Wyoming would lead to decreased healthcare costs. And I'm still waiting for the first document that, that would suggest that that's true. If anyone out there has got it, send it. You know, I, I think um, there was a time when, um, and I would actually let Dr. Kervin answer this since he was a practicing physician and, and lived through this and how it worked on the ground. Um, and my understanding was there was a period of time where medical malpractice insurance in the state was um, very high. Um, I, I haven't heard as much about that recently, um, if that continues to be an issue for providers. Um, a number of providers in the state now, I think it's in the 50% range, are employed by hospitals um, these days. And so that, that um, coverage is provided by their employer. Um, but for independent physicians, I. I know it used to be a, a, a significant issue. Whether it continues to be um, on that side, I, I couldn't say. Well, it looks like we've lost Larry um, for a little bit here. Hopefully, well, he just didn't want to answer this one, did he? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently so. I, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with that one. So, um, if we get him back, maybe we'll, yeah. we'll let him uh, touch on that for just a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll keep moving here though. Uh, got some questions on Medicaid and, um, we'll start through those and, and we've touched on that just a little bit, but, uh, there are hospitals out there that hate Medicaid expansion. So when we're talking Wyoming, uh, share your thoughts. I'd ask Josh to start that <laughs> one. I, I, I'm looking for that hospital. Yeah. That hospital doesn't exist. That's what um, I thought. Yeah. yeah. Every single hospital in Wyoming is supported. Our organization is supportive of Medicaid expansion. The talking point that there are hospitals that hate it, that there are um, states who have expanded and want to get out is just not true. Certainly, there's you can find a legislator in some state. You could find a, a hospital executive somewhere who has perhaps a political or philosophical objection to it. Um, okay. Um, but that's the reality is that expansion has been a net positive for states and hospitals and patients. Um, it doesn't solve every problem, like I said before, um, but it is an important um, tool that some states have taken advantage of and that we wish Wyoming would take advantage of. But there's just not this this feeling of, oh, we expanded. This is a terrible mistake. We need to get out. I mean, that just it's not correct. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that that has actually managed to persist as long as it did, because, I mean, you know, not only do we have groups like the Hospital Association actually weighing in and saying that they support this, but, you know, you have testimony from other states, um, you know, like people on the business end in other states that are talking about this. And um, when you look at the reasons why it's persisted, I mean, you know, part of it, again, is, you know, rehash talking points that just keep on getting cycled over and over um, by, um, you know, certain by people in certain committees but i mean there's you, you got to think when you have you know the homegrown lobby groups like the Wyoming hospital association that are you know working these bills and you know trying to get people the information they need um you know there's also some um other groups that are working on this from the other end uh, i think the most prominent one during the last session was this uh, florida-based group called the uh, i think it was the foundation of government accountability uh and uh if you go through their work uh, i actually looked at some of the uh, research that they had cited, I'd run it past uh, a couple of other researchers at places like, you know, New York University, Georgetown University, and in a lot of these cases, um, you know, the research that they were citing was produced by themselves or their own calculations. If uh, this wasn't peer-reviewed information, and a lot of times it ran counter to uh, much of what the actual hospital administrators were saying, um, and you know, oftentimes you run into these special interest groups that. Uh, really do try and push information that you know maybe benefits a perspective that uh, lawmakers just wanted to hear from the get-go, and um, I think that's kind of 
where you see the persistence of some of these myths. I mean, you know, not only is there a lot of money invested in uh, defeating proposals like Medicaid expansion, but um, you know, there's also just the soft political dynamic that uh, you know, to stay in office, people need to vote a certain way and they need some sort of justification to be able to vote that way. And uh, I've always found that kind of interesting, the dynamics between you know hard power committees and the soft power of uh, outside groups and in particular uh, people's own constituents. Very good. Thank you all. Larry, good to, good to see you back here for a minute. Sorry we lost you. Yeah, um, I, lost my, I, I lost my connection. I just want you to know I'm not dodging the question about liability insurance. Well, well, I, I want to hear your answer on it, Larry. Yeah, too. We were, I was going to head back that direction. Chris and Josh <laughs> yeah. both thought you would uh, you would be the expert there. So, well, uh, I, I think that in the past uh, I was on the bandwagon for liability insurance reform, but in, in reality, I think that what's changed, I think the dynamics changed, and that most physicians now are employees. And this is not a personal issue for them. Not that's not to say that there are people out there who are, are uh, self-employed, who are paying high premiums, but I don't, I don't think the premium itself contributes to the high cost of healthcare in Wyoming. I think what one has to keep in mind is, is do we practice too much defensive medicine? And, and I wouldn't even call it defensive. I think sometimes doctors, uh, um, anybody hates to be wrong, particularly when you're dealing with something as critical as an individual's health. And so there's a tendency to order um, if, if so many tests are good enough, more is better. And, and there's no disincentive to do, it, do that because they're paid for. And so I think we have to look at, uh, uh, you know, and I think this is again where technology could be helpful, artificial intelligence to help us make better decisions about ordering tests. And there's examples where, uh, you know, if we follow guidelines, um, does that protect us against liability? And, and and most uh, 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 plaintiffs attorneys will tell you that doctors don't tend to follow guidelines. And I think that we need to uh, let's kind of look at a bigger picture of what we're doing as far as the way physicians view their liability and, and how they try and maybe practice defensive medicine. And does that add to the cost of care? I think there are studies out there that show that it does. But I think as far as the individual premium goes, that's not a deterrent now because most physicians are um, uh, employees uh, both across the country and I think in Wyoming as well and maybe Josh can correct me if I'm wrong but the other thing I would say is that that, that the cost of liability is, is always going to be there and I think the better approach is can we improve patient safety and I think we need to focus our efforts on making sure that we have uh, excellent patient safety in our facilities because if we do that then that also reduces our liability and I think eventually would bring down the cost of liability. And so those are the comments that I would make. And I'm sorry I lost my internet there temporarily. What, I want to tack on one thing to what Larry's saying because I, he makes some really strong points that while it might not be the premium that's driving the cost at the end of the day, um, there's no question that the, the liability concerns and, and the fact that there is insurance related to liability does drive up healthcare costs. We we do know that. That's a that's a contributing portion. Uh, it's just that capping the torch didn't solve that problem. But if you've got for profit entities, which are the insurers that are billing for the liability insurance, and and they have administrative costs associated with the operation of that insurance, and they have profit taking off of that insurance, then then you know one quarter of those dollars, if not more, are are basically dollars that are, are going into the void, so to speak. They're not leading to beneficial health outcomes for individuals directly. Uh, it, it's sort of one of those um, middlemen arrangements that well, there's this profit taking off of the healthcare sector that is not intrinsic to the healthcare sector. If there were a way to have, um, this is something we're actually doing or, or exploring conceptually over in, in um, the minerals sector on, on sort of a self bonding concept where once you fill that bond, you're self insured, we recognize that, but it's still your asset. There might be ways to improve approaches to liability insurance where you effectively form a collective liability pool. And then once the pool is, is filled, uh, until claims go against it, you maintain the pool. There, there, there are rational approaches to reform, that would probably be bipartisan supported. We don't look for those things though, right? I mean, it's either tort reform must happen or tort reform bad. 
uh, the idea of exploring alternative solutions that, that might lead to a positive outcome doesn't seem to really come up. Thank you for that, Chris. Larry, it was, it was great to get you to weigh in. So thank you all. Um, we talked a little bit about Medicaid and it was pretty unanimous. It sounded like that there are not hospitals in Wyoming that hate the idea of Medicaid expansion. Um, moving on to the from that and the same thought, uh, there are states out there that uh, wish they had not expanded Medicaid and now they are stuck and can't get out. Yeah. Again, there's that's not correct either. Um, and so Montana was a focus in the last um, the last legislative session. It, it continued to come up, and I think some of that was driven by one of the research products of the FGA, if you can call it research. But um, in any case, you know Montana. You know Montana doesn't like it. It's not working out for Montana. It's it's doing all these terrible things to their state and to their budgets which is certainly not correct. And, and at the association, I mean, you know, we would sit in committee rooms, you know, texting, you know, the, the, the leadership at the Montana Hospital Association, you know, who, um, who eventually provided a letter that we, we distributed to um, the House and Senate members saying, you know, this is just, it is just flat wrong. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's a frustrating part of this this mm -hmm. effort to do something um, positive um, for people in Wyoming who fall into this gap where they can't access healthcare coverage. Um, the evidence is clear from other states that it has been a positive move for 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 budgets um, for the financial stability of hospitals, particularly rural hospitals. Rural hospitals benefit the most, um, and certainly. Um, patients, local economies. Um, it, it it helps cover those uncompensated costs that we currently shoulder, and it also gives patients an opportunity to access healthcare in an appropriate way. Um, the the states that have expanded do not want to get out. Now, there is an argument saying, well, if you're out or if you're in, you can't get out. There's no way to get out. Okay. Yes, you can. We we change our Medicaid enrollments and eligibilities in states all the time. Um, it, they're called state plan amendments. It, it's something submitted in our case by our state department of health. Um, the mechanisms to adjust Medicaid, to, to add eligibility groups, remove eligibility groups, add covered services, remove covered services is a, is a pretty standard, um, thing that's done all the time. Um, so CMS on their, on their webpage, on their FAQs said, you know, if you expand Medicaid and at some point decide not to, you change your state plan amendment. Mm -hmm. I mean, that question has been asked and answered, and it continues to come up as an argument against expanding, which um, is puzzling to me, but um, something we continue to run into. I've I've asked directly, I think, three administrations now just for yeah. just for clarity. Uh, you know, in uh, in the Center for Medicaid Services, if we expand Medicaid, can we get out? And uh, the three presidential administrations have said clearly, unambiguously, without any hesitance, uh, yes, you can get out. So I, I just keep asking and uh, hope that at some point people will will believe that that's true. But the, the challenge is it, it's so easy to say something like, well, there are states that regret getting in. No, it's just an assertion. I, I need no evidence to point to. I, I don't need to say which state necessarily or how. Uh, it it gets traction immediately if it resonates with your existing belief system, which is this is a bad thing. Therefore, I believe that statement. I heard that before and I've heard it again. So with, with that resonance, I, I now believe it. Uh, and there's no question there are legislators around the country that say that in various state legislatures because they didn't support it in the beginning and they, they don't support it now. Um, but again, I, I agree with Josh. I've, I've heard of no states that when you dig in, they really want to get out and somehow have been denied, uh, their, their exit desires. And, uh, I keep looking for that too. Yeah. I, I hope this doesn't, um, pull us off track too much, but I, you know, sometimes think, you know, in reverse engineering some of these talking points, why they've managed to persist for so long. And, you know, we talked about the Montana example and, 
I, I think, you know, one reason that really stuck around is, you know, there was like a slight element of truth to some of the opposition talking points. You know, I think one of them was that um, the hospital saw a decrease in profit margins. And, you know, that was true. But, you know, of course, that would be mentioned with alongside the fact that revenues actually increased and that, um, you know, their balance sheets were more sustainable. And, you know, I you know, think that's probably one reason of an element of truth to them that, um to hear what you guys think about that. So, and I'll, I'll just stick with your example, Nick, on that, um, uh, on the on the profit margin side. And so the, going back to what I said before about the nuance and this being complicated and sort of honoring that is in that first year, Medicaid expanded and commercial insurers in Montana decreased their reimbursement by 12% in that same year. Um, now, in the in the years following, um, what you'll see is is greater financial stability and and a better financial picture for hospitals in Montana, again, particularly rural hospitals. But just saying that in this particular one year, you know, hospitals suffered. That's just not the case. And and while maybe there's an element of truth to, you know, up here in the way that it works in the real world, there was other environmental things happening that you know created a situation but like i said before overall it's been a net positive and every year they added their state budgets increased by millions of dollars to their bottom line because of they were able to move some general fund dollars into a into a medicaid program or services that they're paying for out of general fund into a medicaid mm -hmm. program um so it, it, again just another one of the frustrating pieces that um a, a talking point that's thrown out and there and there's much more uh, behind it in the way that the world op actually operates yeah, and i think that's a great point that it it is complicated and and that's why it's so easy to provide misleading data uh, because the data can be factually accurate you can throw out a little kernel that looks bad uh, well state costs for administration of medicaid went up 15 percent because of medicaid expansion right? Oh, wow. That, you know, headline. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's yes, of course it did, because you expanded your population by about 15% through your Medicaid expansion, and it's a linear cost through administration that gets billed 50-50. I mean, these are all the kinds of things that are easily explained away. And, and with Medicaid expansion, particularly in the beginning, you started off with a 100% reimbursement on the cost, but not the administrative side of the cost. So it, it becomes so complicated. It's just easy to throw out these little bits that seem terrifying and, and as if they're going to break the state when in reality, when you see the entirety of the mathematics and you understand that there are complementary and synergistic savings elsewhere. I mean, you look at state struggles with Title 25, right? Involuntary, um, uh, involuntary commitment temporary to, to hospitals uh, and, and the cost associated with that for the state that we've struggled with for many, many years. A lot of those individuals don't have health insurance to bill. A lot of those individuals would be eligible for uh, coverage by Medicaid, and we would be getting 90% of, of the costs associated with that uh, involuntary commitment. Um, we don't even talk about that. It's a tremendous cost to the general fund we, we, we spend. Uh, we also have a lot of mental health programs where we spend a lot of general fund dollars. And at best, we're getting 50-50, but more often than not, we're just paying for them fully out of out of general fund dollars and have been for many years because these programs are important. If we expanded Medicaid, uh, we'd be getting a 90% plus match from the feds to, to cover those same costs that are coming out of state pockets. So when you look at the full budget analysis, uh, particularly in the beginning when it was 100% coverage uh, by the feds and then tailed down, uh, it was a tremendous boon. It would have been a tremendous boon for the state budget. And even now, um, particularly with the ARP Act bump, where we get a 5% additional FMAP, which means the, the feds provide 55% of the funds from the federal government instead of 50% for a period of two years, uh, the state actually comes out ahead financially, as we would have probably in every year that we haven't expanded Medicaid, we'd come out net ahead with additional dollars on the table that we could spend on other programs. 
I'm not an expert, but I would say that everything that's been said is true. And it, it, the, the thing is, at this point, we have this data from all these other states. And, and I tried to, to, to get some more information on this. And I looked at Michigan, for instance. And Michigan has, uh, you know, a sunset uh, rule that if, if they can't uh, show that their cost savings, you know, pay the 10% uh, for Medicaid expansion, they'll sunset out of Medicaid expansion. And so far, they're predicting that out through 2027 20, uh, or 2028, 20, that they'll be able to offset the cost of joining Medicaid expansion by the savings. And so, you know, the data is there that shows the economic benefit, both on the healthcare side and the benefit to the programs. It actually increases access to the things like mental health that, that, that uh, Senator Rothfuss uh, alluded to. And the other thing is the uh, the economic benefit to communities in that, you know, if hospitals have more dollars and their budgets are more stable, they're going to uh, hire more employees. And most states have shown a fairly significant bump in their economic activity based on Medicaid expansion. So everything that I've read, I see absolutely no negatives uh, to Medicaid expansion. And, and one of the reasons we rank dead last in, in health care is because of lack of access. And, and here's a program that expands that access, allows us to have that uh, preventative care when we're, we're uh, uh, treating conditions early on before they become expensive. Uh, we're, we're helping decrease that burden of uncompensated care. Um, you know, I just can't see too many negatives in uh, Medicaid expansion. I don't see any negatives in it, frankly. I don't know if everyone realizes we've effectively turned down over a half a billion dollars. I don't have the up-to-date number, but we're well over a half a billion dollars in total federal funds that we've basically said no thank you to. And that $500 million would have been spent in Wyoming. I mean, that that is part of our gross state product that, that does, uh, you know, lead to dollars spent at local restaurants and and uh, helps to pave the roads and uh, it it really does affect the state's economy and in saying no we've not only denied access to affordable health care uh, to a substantial portion of the population around 20,000 Wyomingites that that don't have that access uh, we've just flat out made a poor choice from strictly an economic standpoint of uh, we we struggle with state revenue, state resources, and uh, state growth. Um, it's a little wonder when you're saying no to $500 million. Uh, we are where we are. Yeah, thank you. Um, sounds like a lot of a lot of misinformation out there about Medicaid and um, the acceptance of that and bringing that into Wyoming or the expansion. Um, and I think this next question might, um, it, it'll be interesting to see the answers to. Uh, we only do have about five minutes left here, but I think this is where a lot of people just uh, are hardline against it. It's socialized medicine. Your thoughts there? Well, look at Medicare. Uh, uh, I don't think too many uh, uh, people like myself who are now over 65 would want to give up their Medicare, but Medicare is a social program. It's, it's run by the government and you know, comparatively, uh, its overhead is probably run somewhere between three and 5%. And, and as we alluded to about the high cost of care, one of the things that you look at when you have for-profit insurance companies is that, you know, their overhead is fairly substantial and that goes into the cost of health care. And, and so I don't think too many people would uh, disagree that uh, Medicare is uh, beneficial and there's a fairly significant part of our population, including myself, that rely on Medicare. And uh, that, that's socialized medicine. And I, I don't see too many downsides to it. Um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, there's social programs um, that allow access to care and improve the overall health come, care and reduce costs would be beneficial to both individuals as well as businesses. And I think one of the things that we have to think about when you talk about universal payers and controlling the cost of health care and prescription drugs is if uh, health care takes up 17% of our GDP, it becomes harder and harder to become competitive in the global marketplace when you're paying for that high cost of health care. So, you know, I think if, if we don't have a system where it's, you know, managed by uh, one entity, um, 
at the continued pace we're going, I think we're going to have some chaos. And so I, I think that uh, there's nothing wrong with having a, um, a system, uh, much like Medicare, uh, that uh, uh, benefits all. Yes, there's not any place in the world where people are 100 percent satisfied with that, with their health care system. But I think we have to look at our very high cost and, and what we get for that. Th there's a mismatch there. And I think one answer to that is to think about having a system much like Medicare that applies to every individual in the uh, state or country. So uh, maybe Chris has comments on that. Yeah, I would just say that th this is one of the challenges that we face is when you when you use inflammatory words as the label and, and start to set the policy debate someplace else, rather than focus on solutions to the problem, uh, you get this polarization that we have. So labeling it socialism is supposed to evoke a visceral response among people that you want then to oppose the outcome. And yes, that happens all the time, right? And that is one of the challenges we face and the reason that we can't get to where we want to get. The reality is what's the best system to lead to favorable healthcare outcomes and affordable access to healthcare for everyone in the country, which I think everyone supports. I, I hope everyone supports that objective, that interest. Uh, I wish we could just focus on that challenge and moving towards it uh, rather than trying to decide whether it's a socialist or capitalist response, just what works. And we do see, we see countries like Germany, less than 12% of GDP for healthcare. France, less than 12% of GDP for healthcare. Uh, and we're up around 17% of GDP. It's tremendous. Uh, it's an incredible difference. And it would make quite a bit of difference. And remember, we're, we're spending 17% of GDP. And we're not even covering everybody with healthcare, except for that early question we talked about where you've got emergent circumstances that are going to be expensive. So you get your healthcare covered, but with a bad outcome. These other countries are spending less than 12% and everyone gets access to affordable health care. Uh, so we should be looking around. Uh, we, we shouldn't be too, uh, too proud to admit that maybe we're not doing this one right and that maybe other countries have a better solution. Uh, we do some things pretty well, but healthcare we're we're rubbish. Let's uh, let's try harder and and look for better solutions. And if we're just going with labels and pitting each other against each other for uh, use of inflammatory words, we're not going to solve any problems, let alone healthcare. Yeah, I, I think that's the reason that the opponents have been successful. Though is uh, socialism is a pretty uh, easy boogeyman as opposed to the. Um, counter argument, which is oftentimes much more complicated and difficult to get into talking points and um, voters, especially um, they glom on the talking points. They love those. Uh, a lot of voters aren't really interested in the details of something. They just need a simple message, what to oppose or what to favor. And when you have groups that are trying to influence that with a simple message, naturally people are going to go in the direction of their constituents uh, who may not have all the information they need. Just Real quickly, I think the two things I would say is that I really, really like Senator Roth's framing of the issue and it's probably a great way to frame any issues, right? It's like what works to do better um, and, and and developing solutions from, from that mindset. And then I guess the other thing I'd say too is I don't, I don't know that the use of socialized medicine in the context of Medicaid expansion is accurate, right? I don't think that's... <laughs> uh, fits the definition of socialism certainly you know the va you know public dollars paying public physician you know publicly employed physicians but if you have public dollars paying private providers um, how that's socialized medicine while the payment might be um, socialized i'm you know i think it's a misrepresentation of the term and used as senator roth has said to sort of incite this feeling of you know to, 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 for, to push back and and reject it as a as a reasonable solution to a problem we face but yeah, and I, I think what Nick said is exactly right, that it, it it's just so much easier to play on people's passions and fears than to build a cohesive, logical series of arguments based on data. I mean, once you start going down that path, it takes a long time and a, a long attention span. And, and even with the best of information, it's really, really hard to come up with solutions. In healthcare, you know, even with a magic wand, we'd struggle to, to do a perfect job and, and get things right. Um, but just in inflaming people's passions against these concepts and, and things that they fear is easier. 
It's a lot easier. And uh, it is what one of the primary things that we struggle against in, in building public support is that giving that speech saying this is socialism is a whole hell of a lot easier than giving the speech that lays out all of the cost benefit analysis of a counter proposal to what we have right now based on Medicaid, Medicare dollars and, and funding streams. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, we are out of time here this morning um, and did have a few more questions, um, but very thankful that we got this time. I think there's a session here um, about misinformation as well. So that's a very interesting one with uh, a lot of the misinformation you guys talked here. Um, but Josh, Chris, Nick, Larry, thank you so much for participating and, and being part of this. We really appreciate your time. Laura, thank you for, for again putting this together and, and thanks for everyone for, for tuning in and listening. Hope this was um, informative and valuable for you. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate the opportunity.